This week on Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. The impact of mentorship on our communities. I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have mentors. We're exploring the benefits and challenges of becoming a mentor, especially as a person of color in Colorado. Plus, how fostering these relationships can help younger members in our community in a positive way. To have a person who is not related to you, just think that you're an absolutely amazing person and can do anything you set your mind to. It, it, it hits home. Welcome to Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. I'm Colorado Public Radio's Nathan Heffel. And I'm Denver 7's Micah Smith. Each week in a partnership between Denver 7 and CPR News, we have a real talk about issues impacting underrepresented people across Colorado and amplifying voices you may not always hear. Today we're talking about the importance of mentorship. Research shows that children who have mentors are 55% more likely to enroll in college and 78% more likely to volunteer regularly. Big Brothers Big Sisters of Colorado matches adult volunteers called Bigs with children known as Littles between 6 and 18 years old. They have formed one-to-one -one mentoring relationships for more than 100 years. Javon Carter was matched with a mentor not quite that long ago. It's been 18 years for him, and he now works at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Colorado. Thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. Thank you guys for having me here today. Honored to be here. So when you were younger, what was going on in your life that kind of necessitated you saying, I'd like to seek out a big brother? Well, if I'm being honest, it was not my idea originally. I would have told you that I'm a strong, independent man who does not need a mentor at that time in my life. Thankfully, my mom had the good sense to know that was not true. I was 10 years old, and uh, for the first time ever, I got in some serious trouble at school. Mm. And my mom just realized me being her first kid and being a young man that she was going to need some assistance, ushering me into adulthood in a positive manner. And so that's when she reached out to the Big Brothers Big Sisters of Colorado. Can you talk about that initial relationship with your big? What did that look like and how did it develop over time? Absolutely. Um, so I think it's important for me to establish that I was not matched with a mentor of color. My mentor was a, a white man in his 20s. And when we first met, I was thinking there's no way that this mm -hmm. is going to be a good relationship. Our match introduction, I can remember very clearly. He walked in. Like I said, he was a white guy in his 20s with a buzz cut. I thought he looked like a cop. And I was like, there's no way we're going to have a good relationship. And in our first conversation, I knew I was dead wrong. Um, we got to talking about music. And he told me that his top three artists at the time were Warren G, Nate Dogg, and Do or Die. And so I knew at that time that, that we had some things in common and maybe this was going to be a good relationship. So how did that develop, that relationship? Because in the beginning you were so like, uh-uh, this is not going to work. Absolutely. Um, I would say the biggest strength that my big had was consistency. He showed up. It didn't matter if he felt like I was excited to be there. It didn't matter if he had something going on in his personal life. If he said, Tuesday the 10th, I'm going to pick you up and we're going to go hang out. Then Tuesday the 10th, Mike showed up at my house. Mm -hmm. And we hung out. What impact did that have on you as your 10 year old black child wanting, craving that consistency? You get it. You find it in your big mic. Absolutely. What impact did that have? Um, it was major. I was at a crossroads at that point in my life. Um, the only major stability I had as far as male support was my mom's younger brother who had just gotten sentenced to 25 years in prison. And so I was I was hurt. I was angry and I was just really confused. I kind of thought that his outcome was going to be my only kind of outcome. And Mike showed me that there is a world full of possibilities of different outcomes, that my future is not predetermined by the people in my family or the things going on in my environment. And like you said, this was a cross-cultural relationship, mm -hmm. right? How does this big brother relationship influence your views today on cross-cultural relationships? Yeah, I am from a low-income community on the east side of Denver, Colorado. And so growing up, I did not always have positive affiliations with non-people of color. And when I got introduced to Mike, he just showing up, being consistent, being willing to show up and be the only person that was white in, in certain settings and things like that and be comfortable in those just showed me that not everybody is against me and I can gain support and gain good relationships with people who are not people of color. You said something really interesting that he was willing to come into environments where he was the minority. Mm -hmm. Was it 
powerful to you that he was willing to step into your environment? How did you feel when he was like, oh, I'll come to your event. I'll come to your home. I'll come hang out in your neighborhood. Yeah. At first, it was it was really surprising the first time I invited him. So I think we we're having like a family barbecue or something. And I was like, I don't you know, I don't know if he's going to show up. But he showed up. He stayed for a while, you know, three, four hours. And he didn't like stick by my side. He branched off. He went and talked with my cousins. He went and talked with my grandma. You know, he really formed relationships with my family just to better understand my life the things that I was going through and, you know, just me overall. And so that just meant it, sh it showed me a lot that he was going to be here and he was here to stay. Javon, what impact did this mentorship have on your life overall? I think Mike did a really good job of anytime we hung out and we were just having fun, he made sure that he was instilling life lessons in me. You know, the power of connections, the power of, you know, you don't get anything for free in this world. You know, you have to work for everything. Just the power of going after and getting what it is that you want. You know, like I said, the environment that I grew up in, and I had a very supporting mother. Don't don't let me, you know, let's not lose that. She was very supportive and always pouring into me. But sometimes you need somebody outside of your family to pour into you. Like my mom pouring into me felt like an obligation. That's my mom. Of course, she thinks I'm the greatest person in the world and I can do anything. But to have a person who is not related to you, who shares no blood with you, me too, and just think that you're an absolutely amazing person and can do anything you set your mind to. It, it it hits home, you know, it sits with your heart heavy. And you start to believe those things. And it showed up in the way I did school. It showed up in the fact that I wasn't afraid to go out for sporting events. It showed up in me getting this, this job. You know, I don't have a degree. And so I was nervous about applying for this job because it's an office job. And typically they require a degree. And he said, look, you have the experience and you're coachable and you're you learn fast. Go for it. And I went for it, and two years later, I'm still here. Now, you're someone today who works to enroll new bigs, yes. right? What do you see as the most significant barrier preventing others from participating in these programs? When people call and they're like, hey, I'm interested in being a big, and they're asking me to tell them about the program, the biggest holdback that people have is they're not sure that they have what it takes to be a mentor. Hmm. They don't know. You know, They're thinking that they need to have some kind of child safety degrees or, you know, child psychology degrees or things like that. And I tell them all the time, if you have the ability to show up, to be empathetic and to show care, you have the ability to be a great big. A lot of people have the ability to be a great a lot big. Of, it takes little to be big. That's our slogan. I love it. Javon Carter, thank you so much for joining us for this Real Talk. And also shout out to your big Mike. Shout out That's to Mike. Who's watching Absolutely. or listening. <laughs> shout out to 100%. Mike. I love it. All right. Coming up next, the CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters and the executive director of a local organization talk about some intentional efforts in reaching communities of color to participate in mentorship. Stay with us. This is Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. Welcome back to Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. I'm Colorado Public Radio's Nathan Haffel. And I'm Denver 7's Micah Smith. This week, we're having a real talk about the importance of mentorship. So to continue this conversation, joining us now are Alicia Cook, President and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Colorado, and Paz Ryant, Executive Director of Apprentice of Peace Youth Organization. Thank you both so much for being here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's start with you, Alicia. You're a first generation high school and college graduate. What role has mentorship played in your accomplishments? It has played everything in my accomplishments mm -hmm. from being a nine-year-old girl and having a mentor who always told me I was different I was going to do something big to a 15 year old mentor who literally saved me from becoming a teen mom to another mentor at 19 who plucked this girl from out of Detroit and sent me on a journey to Japan where I actually found my love of mentoring to even greats like Susan Taylor, who has been a coach to me for over 30 years and mentoring me on this journey of leadership. I have so many follow-up questions. <laughs> you just opened up many doors, but I do want to specifically ask you about the mentor that you had when you were 15 that saved you from being a teen mom. That seems like such a powerful statement to make and a pivotal moment in your life. Would you mind providing a few more details there? Absolutely. So as you know, Micah, 
I was born to a teen mom in the inner city of Detroit. My mom was the single mom of three girls by the time she was 20 years old. At, at the high school I went to, at one point we had 50-something teen girls pregnant in our school and got my first little boyfriend. You know how that goes. Mm -hmm. And let's just say there was a time I called myself, I'm gonna sneak over his house. And my mentor just happened to see me going a different direction from school. And she pulled over and she said, get your with some expletives in this car. <laughs> she said, I don't know what your atten intentions were, but this is not for you. You are bigger than this. You are better than that. And she put me in different programs and she made me her um, after school helper. So I couldn't go nowhere after school, but to hang out with her. And right now she is still my mentor and my friend. And I won't give my age, but let's just say as well over 40 years later. Wow. <laughs> that is so powerful. Yeah. And, and the pillar that this provided in your life, this mentorship, let's pull that out a little bit with Big Brothers and Big Sisters overall and, and, and how that has evolved to provide the stability in young people's lives and the importance of that. How can we ensure diversity in matching bigs to littles, uh, specifically in Colorado? Yeah, it's hard in Colorado. Yeah. Um, you know, just the demographics alone, but with Big Brothers, Big Sisters, I think the model that we have, the one-on-one -on -one model, at least the way it used to exist, it didn't really speak to potential black and brown mentors the way that we do now, the way we go into communities. So breaking down those barriers, showing up in those communities, helping them to understand how much it means for a black and brown child to see a me created in their own image. I am a big mm -hmm. and I love my little sister Tay and it just brings her so much joy to see me and see the things that she wants to do. But more importantly, making sure that we help our all of our mentors, our bigs, no matter what race they are. Yes, you wanna build social capital. Yes, you wanna expose our kids to different experiences, but stop taking them out of their own communities to give them that. Why don't you go into their communities, help them build a better community. Don't give them that impression that life is better outside of their communities. And Javon spoke to that earlier, so that is a very important point. Paz, yes. I gotta get you in on this conversation. <laughs> At a local level, what role does the community play in supporting or hindering the success of mentorship programs? Community plays a significant part, whether it's hindering or support. Um, it's kind of, it's really a partnership with organizations and the community, right? Because the community is where you're able to connect to resources. The community is where you're able to find volunteers. The community is where there are you know, people who, who want to actually give back. I think there's a stigma that our community doesn't want to give back or doesn't want to participate in mentorship and in supporting the community, but uh, I, I would beg to differ. How are you able to navigate those challenges? You know, trying to, uh, striving to be authentic, uh, consistent, um, and being very intentional in how you engage and how you communicate. I think that, you know, our, our culture sometimes doesn't allow for us to have those conversations um, or, or look at things and, and question them in a way and, and still be able to move forward. So um, it's just having hard conversations when needed and, and making the hard decisions when needed. Alicia, the challenges of creating more opportunities for people from underserved communities um, is significant. So how do you give them a chance in participating in mentorship if they already have to overcome some of these some of these hurdles that are already there? D does that make sense? Yeah. So some of the things we're doing, as you all know, we've always had the one on one traditional model and that can be really intimidating to anyone. So for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Colorado, especially when you're going into communities that already have those systemic barriers, one of the things we've done is how do we come to your community and give you little small chances to mentor, things that aren't as t intimidating as literally picking up a child at their home every couple of weeks or so. So we've incorporated now peer and group mentoring 
So we're introducing mentoring, the concept of mentor life earlier. We've incorporated um, different types of workplace mentoring, bringing them to you. Anything to warm you up to, this is not as bad as I thought it was. And I don't have to be perfect. I just have to be present. Mm. And pause, you emphasize something called a third space for kids and teens. What is that and why does it matter for them? Oh, that's a it's a really important thing because ultimately a third space is just um, an informal, relaxed setting outside of home, um, school for children and work for adults. Mm -hmm. Those are typically our primary two spaces. So that the question then becomes, what is that third space? Where do folks go to actually engage with other people, share ideas just in a, in a relaxed environment where it's not about compliance, if you will? You know, when you think about third space, you think about community centers, think about coffee shops, cafes, things like that, parks, right? But um, there are statistics out there that say since COVID, those spaces have been declining. And right now, the, the number one uh, epidemic that we're dealing with is loneliness. Right. People don't have a place to engage and have those conversations, find like-minded people and be able to do the things that they enjoy. And so for us, having those third spaces are extremely important. Right, Paz Ryan, Executive Director of Apprentice of Peace Youth Organization, yes. and Alicia Cook, President and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Colorado. Thank you both so much for joining us for this Real Talk. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> well, coming up, Latinos are underrepresented in corporate jobs and higher education. There's huge untapped potential, and mentorship can be a key to unlocking it. This is Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. Welcome back to Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. I'm Denver 7's Micah Smith. And I'm Colorado Public Radio's Nathan Heffel. You know, there's no substitute for seeing someone who shares your background achieving the same sorts of dreams you aspire to. The Latino community is the fastest growing segment of the population, yet still lags behind their non-Hispanic counterparts when it comes to positions of leadership. According to Latino professionals, just 5% of senior executive leaders in corporate America identify as Hispanic. That means there's an even greater need for mentorship in the community. The Latino Leadership Institute in Colorado uses mentorship to prepare and connect a new generation of Latino leaders and entrepreneurs in our state. Joining us now is Joel Martinez, CEO of the Latino Leadership Institute, or LLI. Joel, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So why did you launch the LLI? Ten years ago, we launched the Latino Leadership Institute because we saw opportunity and promise coming from the Latino community. But to your point, demography does not determine destiny. We're the second fastest, largest growing segment of our population. But today, our leadership gap is the largest of any group at 450%. And if we stay on that track and trajectory, that is actually going to grow to 600% at a time when we are going to double our workforce participation. And so we have to close those gaps, not only for the individuals to succeed, but for our workforce and our economy to continue to thrive. So the LLI believed that we had to, you know, take action to make sure that our destiny fulfilled its promise. Yeah. We know part of that action, part of the LLI, is mentorship. Why was it essential to offer mentorship? When you look at a study from MIT, it talked about the fact that 98% of success oftentimes is determined by your social capital or access to. You think of the role of country clubs or HBCU systems. You know, and that is all about connections. That's about people providing you insight, opening doors for you, and then supporting you along your journey. And for Latinos, less than, you know, 40% of Latinos in the workforce today report having any form of mentorship. And even worse, as you elevate in your career, access to sponsorship is only 5%. So if determining your success comes down to not what you know, but who you know, then the work of the LLI was to create those partnerships, that mentorship, that sponsorship, that social capital, which will ultimately lead to greater success. So is this for career professionals, students? Uh, who, who can find a mentor through your organization? The Latino Leadership Institute works with uh, Latino professionals anywhere from early career all the way to the C-suites. We also have a program that supports our growth and scale Latino-owned businesses here in Colorado. 
both of those programs are centered around not just program to help individuals learn new skills and you know resources, but to actually build the social capital, having access to subject matter experts, having access to individuals that can help support their journey because they have lived their journey. So that cultural relevancy is really mission critical for us. And we've created ecosystems around our Latino professionals and entrepreneurs, not just here in Colorado, but now spanning 36 states and seven countries. Have you had professional mentors, Joelle? I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have mentors. Anyone that knows my story has heard about it. I'm a ninth generation Coloradan. I come from a family of entrepreneurs, political leaders, and just really good community advocates. So I had the benefit of growing up with individuals in my own family who taught me what leadership was all about. But beyond my family that has been very supportive, I had individuals in my career like Catherine Archuleta, a Latina leader who you know, challenged me early in my career with some big questions of, of you know, why I didn't think I was good enough. You know? And I thought that question posed to me very early, why aren't you ready? Why don't you think you're good enough? Was a new way of framing it for me and really making me check some of that self-doubt that I had. I remember one time in particular, I was headed to my first Coca-Cola board meeting and I got on the plane and I was having a lot of imposter syndrome thoughts. And Catherine Archuleta sent me a text and she said, you are more than ready for this position. Go show them what I see in you. We all need Catherine Archuleta's in our corner. I think reaching out and having someone to have that text conversation with is so powerful. Full admittedly, I've not had that. And sometimes I'm having that, well, you got to fake it till you make it, right? But having someone that looks like me who's had that same experience is so invaluable. And, and to say that there are professionals to this day who may not have had that connection. What do you say to those people sitting here or listening being like, I may need this right now? First of all, we all need those connections to help support us in our lives, in our careers, in our journeys to grow and scale our businesses. It's why we created the LLI, and I invite people to join this. Our best effort is through this network, and it's not just about having access to mentors like Catherine. It's about peer-to-peer. -peer. Individuals that are standing shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with you at this moment in your journey we call them success partners and having access to success partners that can root you on, catch you when you fall and remind you of your excellence as you go are critical to our ultimate success and leadership journey. Well, Martinez with the Latino Leadership Institute, thank you so much for joining us for this Real Talk. Thank you. And that's this week's episode of Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. Every week, we have a Real Talk on issues that impact Coloradans who are often overlooked. You can find all of our shows on denver7.com slash realtalk or at cpr.org slash realtalk. Have a great day.